Hi, I'm Xavier McFarlane, and welcome to the Catholic City Podcast from the Mary Foundation. Today's episode features John Michael Talbot, the founder and general minister of the Brothers and Sisters of Charity, a semi-monastic Catholic community based out of the Little Portion Hermitage in Arkansas. He is an award-winning author and multi-platinum Grammy and Dove award-winning contemporary Catholic musician. His autobiography, Late Have I Loved You, was published on Ash Wednesday 2024, along with a new album bearing the same name. We discuss his life as a musician, his time in prayer as a monk, and the woes of American individualism. We go deep into what monasticism and monastic culture really look like, touching on the human need for community, and a few ways to have better community in general in the United States, along with much more. But first, if you want to learn more about Catholicism, or are looking for materials to evangelize family, friends, and fellow parishioners, please visit the Mary Foundation at catholiccity.com to order our Catholic scapulars, books, booklets, medals, and best-selling novels by Bud McFarlane. Sign up for Bud's Catholic City Message, where he's been sharing profound insights, sage advice, and crazy stories for over 25 years. We are also the world's largest distributor of the Purple Scapular, given by Mary to the approved French mystic Marie-Julie Jehenny in the late 1800s. You can learn more at our website, catholiccity.com. John Michael, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. I'm Xavier McFarlane, and I'm here with Anthony Mancini from the Mary Foundation, and we're excited for this conversation. Well, it's great to be with you. Great to be with you. So, you've just released a new book this past Ash Wednesday, an autobiography entitled Late Have I Loved You. Mm -hmm. That sounds like an allusion to St. Augustine, so why that title? Well, uh... <laughs> I had uh, an experience about seven years ago in the hospital, and it was the culmination of uh, doing missions in, in uh, churches across the United States that had started about 2008 uh, after a big monastery fire here in our monastery, Little Portion Hermitage and Monastery, where we were rebuilding the monastery um, and I was doing fundraising for the rebuilding of the monastery. So I was doing something I had never done before. I'd usually spent most of my time in hermitage uh, here in real contrast to uh, what the typical Christian artist did, which is 150 concerts a year and an album a year. I spent most of my time in solitude here at the Hermitage uh, and did recordings and books as the Spirit led, and mm -hmm. they were wildly successful beyond what, because I didn't even try to be successful when I was, which is a whole other story. We'll get to that. But uh, um, so I had to go out and do these things, and I ended up being on the road about 200 days a year and about 150 appearances uh, in parishes across the United States. And it really was wonderful at the beginning. I had lost a lot of weight. I was down to my high school weight, um, which felt great. I had all kinds of energy. And that worked great for seven or eight years. But then I began writing checks that my body couldn't cash as I was getting older. And I, I started winding up in the hospital on the road, and uh, the Lord was saying, stop, stop, stop. And I said, okay, Lord, I'll slow down. I'll slow down. I'll slow down. He said, no, stop, no, stop, no, stop. I said, I'll slow down. I'll slow down. Long and short of it is, is through these series of hospital stays, I ended up stopping my itinerant ministry. It ended up a godsend because COVID hit shortly thereafter. And Consequently, I didn't have to cancel a bunch of concerts or postpone them because I'd already stopped. But my illness didn't stop, and I ended up in the hospital, and I was so sick that I couldn't think. I wanted to praise God, but I couldn't think objective thoughts. It hurt to think objective thoughts. So all I could do was lay in the bed and kind of mumble praises, kind of like in tongues, you know. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, blah, 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 kind of like that. And uh, 
uh, I did that for hours. And in the midst of that, uh, two angels, I know one was my guardian angel. I think the other was the angel of death, to be frank, Mm. lifted me up and took me out of my bed and out of the hospital room. (coughs) And uh, I saw paradise from a distance. And Jesus was in the midst of it. It was surrounded by kind of a Marian blue. It was very bright, but brighter than anything I'd seen. But it was easy to view, easy to look at. And as I was looking at this, suddenly, in a flash, outside of time, because you're outside of time in these kinds of experiences, Mm -hmm. I saw all of my sins and all of God's forgiveness and mercy all at once. And I experienced sorrow for my sins and joy for his mercy and forgiveness all at the same time. And all I could do in response to that was weep. So this this was overwhelming, mm-hmm. as you might imagine. And after I had experienced this sufficiently, the angels turned me, around, turned me around and brought me back to the hospital room where I was mumbling in tongues. And after I got better, they, they discharged me from the hospital. I went back to the monastery where while I, anytime I would pray, all I could do was weep. This went on for a year and a half or so. Mass exploded. It was like the roof came off the church and heaven and earth met angels, saints. Every They were all there. It was a crowded room, you know. And I was blown away and all I could do was weep, but especially in the anaphora or the Eucharistic prayer, it was overwhelming. And the consecration uh, between the epiclesis and the words of institution, I was at the foot of the cross. Jesus was giving his life for me, shedding his blood for me. I was at the empty tomb where he was, where he had risen I was at the Mount of Ascension. It was all happening. It wasn't, in the modern sense of the word, just something that happened 2,000 years ago. It was right now. And all I could do was just weep profusely. And that's really still kind of the case today, seven years later. So... It's radically taken what was already, I believe, a very lively Catholic life and just exploded it. It's just taken it and expanded it to the, like the blinders came off, you know. Hi there, listeners. Just a quick break and we'll get right back to the conversation with John Michael. The outside of time experience he just described that is being shown all of his sins and all of God's mercy is actually something that has happened to others before. To learn more about these illuminations of conscience, please order the Mary Foundation's book, The Warning, which contains five true stories of these occurrences as told by five real people from all different walks of life. Copies are available for only $1 each at catholiccity.com. You can find a link in the description. Now, back to the conversation. So the writing of the book and and the new recording, Late of I Loved You, are my feeble attempts to update the, in the, in, with the books. There are two previous biographies. One was a bestseller. The other one sold very well. The first was Troubadour of the Lord, and the other was Signatures. 
And my editor said, well, don't get the biographer to write it. Why don't you do it as an autobiography? Tell it in the first person. Let's shorten it because it was going to be very, very long. And, and tell this story about the hospital. And also tell some stories, you know, about, you know, your your life in in the world with a rock and roll band and secular music and um, and also your life in founding a community and those kinds of things. <laughs> but tell it as a personal story. So I did. That's the book. And with music, try to, I wanted to try to feebly, and I emphasize feebly, try to capture some of what I experienced in that time in in paradise and put it into sound <clears throat> in a way that wasn't just going to come and go mm -hmm. by the use of a lot of electric instruments that tend to come and go with fads. So I, I tended to use all acoustic instruments. Uh, we did use one synthesizer, but its use is very minimal. But it's mainly orchestral and then choral. Mm -hmm. So all um, of this yeah. is what built into the title, Late Have I Loved You, in that it kind of sounds yeah. like what you're saying is you reached a, a new level or maybe even to use to borrow from the interior mansion like you've reached a new layer within the castle right right i mean i mean i've always believed for instance in the eucharist in the real presence of jesus it's always been powerful even mystical but not like this and and i feel like augustine you know late in my life have i loved you like this i feel like aquinas you know, I've I've sold millions of records. I've sold hundreds of thousands of books. Uh, I founded a community. I've received all these awards in my life. Uh, you know, I don't know how many tens of thousands of conversions to Christ and into the church and, you know, through the ministry that I've done. But it's all straw compared to what I experienced. It really is, because heaven is, heaven is our destiny. What we experience on earth is just practice. Speaking That's of that, because inevitably we could talk about any one of these things for multiple hours, which would be awesome. I think we could step back through then what you said there. This life is practice. And yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds from what I understand of your life, I I didn't I'm too young to have lived through most of a lot of your ministries or your fame. Um it it sounds like your whole life's goal from a certain point on was to find get close to Christ and to bring others there. And it started with, you know, your conversion a long time ago and and coming to like the through through the Franciscans, right? There was something about their lifestyle that drew you. Yeah, I, I mean, ironically, I just shared this in the last podcast I did an hour or so ago. Um, my my goal has never been to do. It's been to be. To be in communion with Christ so that whatever he gives me to do can be free in his will and accomplish whatever he wills. I've never uh, tried to possess my ministry. I've never tried to direct it, to possess it, I've, I've, the only thing I've ever sought to do, and I believe this is Francis, 
was to be in Christ. Francis spent, scholars say, 75% of his time in prayer, either in the hermitage or walking on the roads in contemplative silence. He only spent 25% of his time in apostolic action, whether that was preaching or whether that was taking care of the lepers or feeding the poor. He spent 75% of his time in prayer. That's rather mind-blowing, considering that in a mere 20 years of his religious life, he revolutionized Europe. He and his movement revolutionized Europe. Uh, some would say uh, Dante said that the Franciscans carpeted Europe in his day. Uh, they had reached all the way up into England and Ireland. Uh, they had gone to the Holy Land. They had reached within a few, very few years, they had reached all the way to China. Can you imagine? And yet Francis himself lived in contemplative prayer. He founded 24 different hermitages. I founded one. <laughs> and it's really hard to do. I founded one. Of course, the religious environment today is radically different than it was in Francis's day. Our, our, we live in such an anti-Christian uh, and anti-Catholic culture today. Trying to found something nowadays is very, very difficult. So uh, Francis lived in a much more uh, Catholic-friendly era than we do today. So it's a little different. But, but still, can you imagine founding 24 different hermitages? I cannot. That is incredible. Talk about yeah. the, the Holy Spirit working in his life. I'm curious about, um, you, can you expand on the anti-Catholic culture that we have in our, in our day and age contemporary? Well, I don't know whether I can say much more than what people already know. I mean, Your take. Uh, in, our, in my lifetime, we have gone from a Judeo-Christian culture and through first the uh, the the basically the intellectual climate of the fifties, forties and fifties, and even going back further if you really want to trace it, but it really blossomed in the sixties. And in my generation, God help us, uh, in the sixties, we managed to destroy the foundations of the Judeo-Christian uh, culture of, of uh, our civilization. So it went from being, uh, you know, Christianity and Catholicism were passively tolerated uh, for a, a, a good number of years and a couple of decades to now I don't think we're just tolerated. I think we are actively resisted. Mm. Uh, and that, that's where things are today. And it's, it's not to the point of violence, but it is to the point of, of uh, media resistance without a doubt and political resistance if, if many would have their way. Mm. So it's very, very... Uh, it's overt nowadays. It's Almost not, to the level of persecution. Not, yeah. Yeah, it's not subtle anymore. Yeah. To ask a question then, and this is one I'm actually going to steal your words from in the book because you were, you were reflecting on the early days of your attempt at monastic life um, and I, where most of the people ended up leaving after your quote-unquote reform. And yes. you use the words, can Americans be saved? And like, what lesson did you learn from that experience that made you ask that question? And then what answer did you come to? Well, the answer is, yes, they can be saved. But through many, many difficulties, we are a, 
we are a highly individualistic culture. And even though in the church, there is a highly, you know, neo-traditional movement going on, just kick that neo-traditional movement with the toe of your boot a little bit, and down underneath it is still a very individualistic culture and individualistic people. So it's almost like an extreme reaction to the extreme individualism that is at the essential core of the people of our culture. So they're almost, it's almost like people are grasping for some kind of answer to fix themselves. And so they're grasping for an extreme conservatism to try to fix the extreme individualism that is uh, almost at the core of their being uh, that, that, is, that they know is there. So Dun Scotus said, and John Paul II quoted this all the time, uh, Dun Scotus said that each human being is a uh, unique and unrepeatable gift from God. But always, and this is Scotus, is in, in, in the context of community. So the, the uniqueness of each individual is never seen outside of the context of community. Individualism is individuation gone bad. Individualism sees the individual as a unique and unrepeatable gift, not necessarily from God, but at the expense of community. Mm-hmm. So, so instead of, of the, the individuation giving rise to interdependence, it gives rise to an individualism that essentially destroys expressions of community, firstly in the family and then moving on out into other forms of community, such as, you know, religious life, monasteries, uh, the workplace, and then reaching on out even into a culture. That's interesting. Um, it reminds me of something or we just recorded with a guy named Keith Nestor. He's a convert. Mm-hmm. He was a um, Protestant pastor before he converted. And we asked him kind of the, the typical, like, oh, what are one, what's one of the differences you saw sort of before and after Protestant Catholic? And he said, in different words, kind of a similar critique of Catholicism, at least the way it's practiced broadly in America. And I can, which is that Ironically, like we think of the Protestant idea as, you know, personal Jesus, your individual relationship with Jesus. And yet he said one of the things they did best was their community around Jesus coming together. And then on the flip side with um, seeing Catholic life and Catholic parishes in particular, he was like, a lot of people just look at it as it's my individual job to go check the Catholic boxes. And, you know, you can live a sacramental life and go to mass and confession and adoration and all that but as individuals and we totally lack at least structurally this natural community. And as, Mm. so it's, it's kind of ironic. It took the Protestant convert to say Catholicism is kind of Protestant looking, but in a weird way. Well, it's, it's a, that is a, a terribly, terribly sad commentary on the Catholic experience today. Because when I became a Catholic in 1978, that was reversed. One of the reasons I became Catholic was because there was such an experience of community in the Catholic Church. And compared to the Lone Ranger Christian idea that was so predominant in the Jesus movement, uh, which had renewed my Christianity 
uh, in in my life, but I couldn't find any real Christian community in the Jesus movement. Everybody was kind of doing their own thing. And it was in the Catholic Church that I found a sense of community in not only historic monastic and religious life, but also in covenant communities within the charismatic renewal, and even in parishes where there was a real sense of community in parishes that I didn't see in Protestant churches. So I think he's, he's, I think he's right to tell you the truth. When you go to, and, and he's probably right about big mega churches that are not Catholic as well. But, you know, if you go to some of the big mega churches in some of the major cities in America today, uh, oh, I don't know. There's still core members of parishes that are really community minded, forming small groups, uh, that kind of thing, and hanging around in the church, you know, after the mass and that kind of thing where they're really building relationships. But the average Catholic is perhaps just checking their Catholic box. He might, he might be right. But I can tell you that in a monastery where we are taking people and trying to get them to live together and give up this individualism, <clears throat> which is part and parcel of monastic life, it is exceedingly difficult, and very, very few Americans can do it. I'll just say that flat out. Very, very few Americans can do it. And if you look at the statistics, very, very few Americans can do it in marriage as well. And if you look at the statistics on Catholic marriages, it's also true of Catholic marriages. Mm hmm when you say monastic life, I know I I know what you mean because I just finished, you know, reading your book, but I think a lot of people are probably confused as to what exactly that means. I do uh for example, there's a, a guy at our parish who I think might have lived in one of your communities for a bit. Um and nobody really knew what that meant. Uh like is it some questions that might get asked are like, wait, is that a religious order? Is it just lay people doing their own thing? Can you explain what you mean when you say that? Because I know there's um, both people who have vowed to be um, celibate, but also married people and children. Can you just paint oh, a picture in our, for in us? in our community. Yeah. yeah. Well, might, I, like might I add just briefly, um, this I think is a good opportunity to clear up a misconception of a monastic life being that of just – totally interpersonal uh, prayer life, your relationship with your personal relationship with Christ that we're saying isn't, isn't complete without community. So a lot of people say, oh, monastic life. And you even talk about St. Francis being uh, in this contemplative state for 75% of his time. And then he's out in the community for 25% of the time. It's like, what, what does the monastic life offer for those who have this misconception that you're kind of locked up in your cell for most of your time doing individual stuff? So. Well, first of all, let me clarify that technically in Western thought, meaning Roman Catholic thought, Francis of Assisi is not technically a monk. He's technically part of a movement that started in about the uh, oh the 12th century, 13th century, 14th century, called the mendicant movement, which is distinct from the monastic movement. And what made it distinct was uh, their vow of obedience was to a superior that was over either a region or over the entire universal church and not just to an abbot over a particular monastery. It was called the mendicant movement. So let me clarify that for any Franciscans out there who might be listening to your, to your podcast, mm -hmm. uh, because they can, they can get a little hacked off when we call Francis a monk. 
-hmm. but to but to the average person they think of francis as a monk but technically he's a mendicant Mm. um um the there there are there's a lot between what you two guys just said that needs to be clarified first uh monk the word monk comes from the greek word monos which means one and alone anytime jesus went to be alone it's uh comes from the greek word monos and it just means one and alone uh so the early monks went to be one to be alone and obviously it applied to hermits like with saint anthony of the desert but very quickly it also applied to uh, groups of monks uh, with St. Pacomius, who practiced what was called koinonia, which means c- common or community or fellowship or communion, communio. And uh, that actually could mean thousands of monks living together in one place. So they were one, meaning unified, but they were one and alone. They repeopled old villages uh, in Upper Egypt, which means they were south, up the Nile, and but they were called monks as well, even though they were living together. Hmm. So uh, it can apply to hermits. And it can apply to monks who live together. And that got Latinized to mean Cenobitical monks, Cenobites. So there are Aramites and Cenobites. The word Aramite comes from the word, or gets Latinized into the word hermit. So hermits can be monks and Cenobites can be monks. Mm. There are also semi-hermits and that's what we are here they have groups of cells and the word cell in latin just means a small room and uh it's like jesus says when you pray go to your what to the inner Inner room room, Mm -hmm. uh which means the storeroom well and that to put it in modern sense means go go to your uh Go to the, uh, uh, um, oh gosh, uh, my, my mind just went blank. Go to the, uh, uh, um, it's totally blank. The storeroom? Not the storeroom, where you keep your food in your house. The cellar. That pantry, called? cellar. Yeah. Go to the pantry. Go to your pantry. So it's dark, it's undistracted. So you're undistracted in there, but there's a lot of good food in there. So there's a lot of good spiritual food in the in your cell, but you're totally undistracted. So the cell is a place where you're undistracted, but there's a lot of good spiritual food in there. And it can also mean the place where heaven comes to earth, where the you know, where the celestial and the 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 earthly meet. So they're groups of cells scattered around a common church and a common dining room and some work buildings. So that's what we have here at Little Portion. Uh, We are two and a half miles from the nearest paved roads up in the Ozark Mountains. It's absolutely stunningly beautiful here. Um, It's uh, not in the desert. We live, you know, in the mountains. There's trees and woods and we have gardens and workspaces. We support ourselves here uh, through my publishing work and also through our bakery. And we grow most of our own food. And we have a, a, a guest house where we keep retreatants. People come here on retreat all the time. So, you know, not everybody lives in the desert. And as monasticism spread into Europe, that just meant wilderness or uh a solitary place. Eremite, where we get the word hermit, uh, essentially just means uh, a wilderness area. Mm-hmm. 
So it means away from the hubbub of the city, just a solitary place. The way we live it here, and monasticism has evolved in, or developed, I should say, in both the East and the West, each with their own respective history and and uh, developments. Uh, St. Augustine lived monasticism in the city. It was an urban monasticism. St. Basil of Caesarea had more of an urban monasticism. Benedict of Nursia uh, had more of a rural monasticism in the West, uh, and so on and so forth. So there, it developed in different ways in different regions. But uh, the way we live it here is we have uh, an integrated monasticism, which uh, probably the, the monasticism we we, do, we imitate most is Celtic monasticism, where they had monks, nuns, and families in a monastic village. So that's what we have here. We have monks, we have sisters, and we have singles and families. I'm part of the family expression. Viola and I have been married 35 years. We're the founder and founders of this monastery. Um, and uh, it works wonderfully here with brothers, sisters, singles, who for various reasons don't feel called to become uh, celibate brothers or celibate sisters, and then families. And we've had families with lots of kids here. Some of them have moved out. Some of them have stayed for a long time. And, uh, and then we also have a community of people who live in their own homes in various ways. Sometimes they meet together virtually because they're isolated from each other. So they meet via Zoom and different, different uh, um, uh, you know, different uh, form, uh, different uh, what are they called platforms? But usually it's Zoom. Sometimes uh, they meet together once a week in person, and some of them live in what are called cluster groups, where they they have moved together in the same neighborhood. And, you know, come together like once a week formally, but they meet together informally, you know, throughout the week and they all go to the same parish together and that kind of thing. So it has a broad, uh, a broad way. They have broad ways of expressing themselves. We yeah. all profess the evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity and obedience but in ways that are appropriate to our state of life. And we exist under um, the Bishop of Little Rock. We're a diocesan public association of the faithful. And there's about 10 communities like ours in the Catholic Church. Most of them are in Europe. We're the only community of our kind in the United States that's indigenous to the United States. Um, it's very, like I say, it's very difficult to make community work in our particular culture, even more so than in Europe, because Europe is a more community-minded culture than ours. Which and Europe, which country? And Europe has yeah. Which countries in Europe? Um, main yeah. Italy, Italy, Germany, and France primarily. Hmm. So you kind of answered in some way. The next thought I had was more of a question. Hmm. Having done this first, I guess it's a two-parter one, and this is probably just a, an overstatement, but would you, would you hold the position that everyone should live this way? Or if not, how, like, what's, what's your opinion of the cure more or less like in America, given what you've seen with our culture, how do we spread deep communal life in, th in the faith? No, I don't think everybody has to live this way. I think more and more people will begin to live this way as our culture fails more and more. I don't have great hope for our culture. I think it is inherently flawed on many different levels. Um, 
Before World War I, 24 out of every 25 families in America lived on the farm. After World War I, 24 out of every 25 families lived in the city. After World War II, 49 out of every 50 families in America lived in the city. It is much, much, much higher than that now. I think just regarding what producing the basic needs of the human being, I think we have moved further and further and further away from what it takes to produce what we basically need to live. And I think that puts a civilization in a highly precarious situation. Uh, and, a, and a civilization that gets in that, that situation is easily toppled. Uh, think mm -hmm. the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was easy to topple once the citizens of Rome no longer knew how to produce what they needed to live. The slaves knew how to produce what they needed to live, so the slaves could easily rise up and topple the Roman Empire. So we are, we are a people entirely cut off from knowing how to produce what we need in order to to live. And we are a people cut off from the notion of basic human community. Namely, I think God created us to be a tribal people, and we have become uh, an urban sprawled people, which does two things. It, it creates this urban sprawl, and it also makes us incredibly lonely because most of the people in the urban sprawl are, are cut off from real relationships with other people. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the biggest thing, I mean, if you read, there's a, a wonderful new book on sociology out called iGen and it's on the generation from college level on down mm -hmm. sometimes um, called gen z or even zoomers right the, the the suicide rate is through the roof these young kids do not know how to have face to face relationships with each other they only know how to relate to each other texting one another have you had in your experience seen sort of like the reverse of breaking amish i guess like where someone who grew up in our current modern culture is exposed to deep community are they thirsty for it or do they recognize that it is the thing they're thirsting for or do they reject it uh, do you get what i'm asking yeah absolutely i th i think they th I think they thirst for it. I mean, we have people come here all the time who thirst for it, want it. But once they experience it, they are scared to death of it because it is alien to anything they have ever experienced before in their life. In other words, they can talk it they can write a paper on it. They can text it. They can they can do an they can do a podcast about it. But they have a a terribly difficult time doing it. That definitely rings true. With um, Anthony and I run a small a young adult group at our parish. And mm -hmm. one of the challenge, one of maybe the biggest challenges is not necessarily coming up with, you know, what Bible step passage to look at or what speaker video to play or what topic for discussion. It usually mm -hmm. just comes down to the like everyday human interactions. This person feels like that person is doing X, Y, or Z, or this person's annoyed at them or somebody's too loud or whatever it is. Yeah. It's always the regular old human stuff that are, is where the difficulties come up. And it's exactly. 
Dorotheus of Gaza gives us the best cure for conflict resolution back in the 6th century. He says, whenever you think your brother is irritated with you, always take the blame. Always. That's fascinating. Yeah, he says, maybe you did something that you don't even know that irritated that brother. Maybe it's your countenance. Uh, there was a guy in this community, golly, 40 years ago. He's now deceased, God rest his soul. And we died dear friends, or he died, he and I were dear friends. And he says, at one point he said to me, John Michael, all you have to do is walk in the room and I hate your guts. Whoa. I, I said, why? He says, because you're so successful and I'm not. He says, all you have to do is walk in the room and I cannot stand you. And that we had to start from ground zero. We had to start round, right there. I had to start by humbling myself before this man to cure that relationship. This is I I I didn't I didn't have to say to him, "Oh, we'll get over it." Mm -hmm. I had to start by saying, "Please forgive me." Now, that was and I was young and I was brash. This was 40 years ago. And it was hard. It was really, really hard. It's easier for me to do that kind of stuff now. When you're young, it's hard. But that's what Dorothea says you do. And he says, once you can do that and not get defensive, now you can begin to work out the relationship. And now you can begin to talk it through and even make, even say, eventually, maybe you need to correct the brother and say, you know, brother, maybe, maybe you need to work on that yourself a little bit, but you can't bring that to him if you have any self-defensiveness in yourself or any anger at the way he's getting angry at you. If, if you've got that anger in you because he's angry at you then you can't you can't heal it mm -hmm. you've got to take it and and ask forgiveness only then can can there be healing that's i mean that's jesus and dorothea says it very very clearly so we are uh, running on time a little bit we have 5 maybe 10 more minutes depending on yeah. how long you want to answer um just what's some general advice for the world based on all of your wisdom from this near-death experience and your life in this monastic way and particularly your more secluded, more hermitage-sided part of it recently in recent years. Just what wisdom can you offer broadly to this generation and this culture and world? Can I add one thing to that? Um, and you answered this very briefly when we spoke uh, before this interview, uh, but if you would touch on some ecumenical work, um, you don't have to go into specific examples, but just rough guidelines as to how to get a fellow brother or sister in Christ to turn to Catholicism. But, oh. yeah. Well, the first thing I tell people about Catholicism, and I have dear friends who aren't Catholic, the first thing, and I'm going to follow Metropolitan Callistus Ware, God rest his soul. He was an uh, Eastern Orthodox Metropolitan. And he said, the first work in ecumenism is to learn how to be friends. Never see people as potential converts, ever, because you objectivize them. Simply learn how to be friends and love each other as friends. Um, I think that's so important. And just share the love of Jesus Christ with them. And you can share your faith. 
share how your Catholic faith has enriched you, but never pushing them towards the edge of the pool. I, I, I share my Catholic faith all the time. I say, come on in, the water's fine most of the time. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, we've mm-hmm. got our fair share of troubles, but it's still the best ball game in town, you know? Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't, I'm not a big believer in pushing people in the pool. I've been pushed in swimming pools early in my life, usually at drunken parties. Hmm. It, it was never a fun experience. But I am a big believer in, you know, on a hot day, you know, and you're in the pool and you say, hey, brother, hey, sister, come on in. The water's fine. So that's invitation. I send out invitations a lot. And lots and lots and lots of people have become Catholic. Thousands of from what I kind of gather from the responses I get. But it's mainly because they've listened to my music or they've listened to my story on why I became a Catholic. It's because I read the Church Fathers, and I read The Imitation of Christ and The Life of Francis and Benedict of Nursia and the Monastic Fathers and Mothers, and I found stuff there I couldn't find anywhere else. And it enriched my life. And other people go, you know what? That's what I'm looking for, too. And they read it. And they study it, and they pray it, and the dominoes start to fall, and they make the same decision. So, come on in, the water's fine. So that's ecumenism. Uh, So if there's anybody out there listening to this, you know, make that journey yourself. Uh, But like my dear mother said, she became a Catholic a year after I did. And she turned, she was a little fiery Irish woman, and before she became a Catholic, she was reading all the same books I was reading. And she turned to me and she says, but Johnny, I'm doing this not because you did, but because I want to. And I said, that's good, Mom. <laughs> <You know? laughs> People have to do it really because the Holy Spirit is leading them, not just because I did or somebody else did. Amen. There were two things you said that one struck me and one I'd never heard before. The first one was, I think people are used to going, we shouldn't objectify, you know, use things, yeah. love people. So it's an easy kind of call to error. And I'd never thought of looking at someone as a potential convert as an objectification, but I totally see that. And it makes, yeah. it makes perfect sense. Like obviously nobody wants to be viewed as an object, even if it's a nice object. And then secondly, I think you inadvertently answered the first question about advice for the world in the same way as the second question, which is simply just learn how to be friends with people. Yeah. And acknowledging that that's actually a skill set and a behavior that is learned and you, and you have to put an effort and you can, you're going to be bad at it and everyone else is going to be bad at it and learn with you and learn over time. It's like, it's weird to think that we have a culture where people did not learn how to be friends. Yeah. Well, the second part of the question though, my brother, is I'm going to say this, I'm at a place in my life. I've done so much. I've toured the world. I've toured the United States. I've done so much ministry. And I'm glad I did. And it accomplished a lot. I I don't doubt that. But I'm an absolute believer. I'm at a place in my life where God is calling me to prayer. Deep solitary prayer. And I'm a big believer. In a sense, our culture is tired of our words. They've heard our words. They've heard our arguments. And for the most part, they've rejected them. And what what I think the world needs right now is deep prayer. First of all, prayers of penance for ourselves. I pray for my own sorry soul. And I got to tell you, my soul is often a, I'm a sorry soul. I need penance. I need conversion. And then I pray for the salvation of the world. And I weep when I pray. I weep for myself. 
I weep for the world. We need deep prayer. I pray the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And the depths of each of the meaning of each one of those words. I have a book out on the Jesus prayer. The words are infinitely deep. And just to pray that is an intuition. Um, we need deep, deep prayer for our salvation and the salvation of the world. And then to really love, to love, to love like Jesus loved. Not theology, not ideas, the love of God. That's what the world needs today. Amen. Thank you, John Michael. And thank you for spending the time to come on and share some of the thoughts and wisdom from your life and book. Where can people find your book and your music, uh, the new album? Go to uh, johnmichaeltalbot.com. You can find out about all my books and, and recordings. Uh, you can find about the Brothers and Sisters of Charity. We would welcome you into our community. We desperately need monastic members. We need vocations. You might be called to our domestic community. You would be welcome to join our domestic community. We need new members. We need young members. Please join us. Uh, I believe that the Catholic Church needs to rediscover the monastic contemplative beating heart of the church that we have lost in recent centuries. Let's rediscover it together. Uh, and you can help support us by uh, supporting our our bakery. We have a wonderful bakery. Uh, go to littleportionbakery.org. And you can also come here to make a retreat uh, or just enjoy the wonderful grounds of our monastery. I promise you, you will be blessed by it. And lastly, you can go to my Inner Room School of Spirituality. It's an online school that goes through uh, my many books and goes through really the, the, the spirituality behind my music and behind my books. And you would be welcome to do all these things. All right, great. So make sure to check out the book, the music, the website, consider that monastic life. And thank you for listening all the way to the end. That's all folks. We hope you were inspired by this podcast and encourage you to share it with anyone you think would appreciate it, whether via social media, a text, or even an old-fashioned word-of-mouth recommendation. We also warmly invite you to distribute our Catholic scapulars, medals, books, and booklets to your family, friends, parish, and social groups. Visit us online at catholiccity.com for more information. The real work of the Mary Foundation is accomplished by people just like you. There are three ways to help. First, please pray for everyone who hears, reads, or receives our materials. Second, share them with everyone you know, family, friends, fellow parishioners, and the people you work with. Only you can reach them. Finally, please help us financially. It seems impossible, but we don't do traditional fundraising here at the Mary Foundation. We rely on your generosity and God's providence. By the way, if you, your parish, or your Catholic group would like to distribute our materials by the dozens, hundreds, or even thousands, all we ask for is help covering our materials costs, so please visit us online for suggested donations. For our Canadian friends and those outside of the United States, only online requests are accepted, so please refer to the special shipping rates listed on our website. Thanks for listening, and we're looking forward to working with you. May God bless you always. And now, here's a short preview of our Rosary and Divine Mercy Chaplet, likely the most popular rosary recording in the history of the world. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. For an increase in the virtues of faith, hope, and charity. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. All rights are reserved, and duplication without permission is prohibited.